I was supposed to sit. You can sit but wherever you want. I'm going to sit here. Uh, <laughs> hi, I'm Dan Fromer. I am the editor of Recode. And uh, this, is the, uh, this is the advanced uh, blockchain analytics panel, right? <laughs> oh, mobile. Talk about whatever you want. Local with mobile. All right, never mind. Um, why, don't we, why don't we just uh, have everyone introduce themselves since there's so many and uh, who you are, where you are, uh, and, and maybe an interesting fact. Interesting fact. Shit. Um, so I'm Jesse Middleton. I'm now a general partner of Flybridge Venture Funds. They do seed and Series A investments here on the East Coast. Uh, but prior to that, I spent almost five and a half years building WeWork from the earliest days where we were five or six people till where we're now over 100 buildings around the world. So happy to talk about how we do things locally and globally. Uh, as far as a fun fact or an interesting fact, uh, I had my first kid recently. I've been with my wife for over 11 years, and it's something to look at when you see this like human being stare up at you and you realize, shit, I better do what I love every single day of my life so he understands how to live his life, and that's something that I think I'm trying to do the fullest going forward. That was adorable. <laughs> if you follow me on Facebook, you'll was, see all the photos. <coughs> I was assuming <laughs> that an interesting fact would be about uh, location services, but that works, I, I think. I shit yeah. about that. <laughs> that was so sentimental. <laughs> <laughs> Just wait till they get to be 12 and 14. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm Walt Doyle. I'm the CEO of Gas Buddy. We are the largest community of fuel and sea store enthusiasts on the planet. Um, as a fun fact, uh, back a long time ago when I was living in Hong Kong, um, I had the, uh, the privilege of helping to launch the Mongolian Stock Exchange. It lasted for six months. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. That's awesome. Uh, I'm Steven Rosenblatt, president of Foursquare. Uh, we're the leading location intelligence company. A lot of you may know us from our consumer apps, Foursquare and Swarm, um, but the company's broadened and, and really evolved in a big way. Um, and uh, two fun facts. One is I've known this guy for a long time, and <laughs> I worked for a company, Quattro Wireless, where we made this guy money. We both made right? money. And he sold his company to eBay, and the second fun fact is I sold my company to, to Apple. That's so right. That's here right. we are, back Good together times. again. Good times. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Careful. Hi. Um, I'm Kelly Cleo. I'm the founder of Loverly. Loverly, for the last four years, has been a media platform to help inspire modern couples and help them plan their weddings. Um, as of about four months ago, we just introduced a new product, First Virtual Wedding Planner, where couples can, for the first time, download the app and get a flat fee affordable wedding planner that they can text with through their phone. Fun fact, um, I get invited to more weddings for people that I don't know that well, because I think they just want me to be there. And <laughs> oh, that's good. I don't really love weddings that much. <laughs> And I've never been married. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, Dennis Scott. Uh, I'm in the host seat. Uh, <laughs> uh, Take it away. <laughs> so, so I head up a uh, consumer marketing for Open Table, uh, which is the largest network of restaurants and reservation company in the world. Uh, a fun fact was that I joined Open Table after living for four and a half years in Hawaii, um, which, yes, I do miss. I get asked that a lot. But it's good to be back. All right, so that's our panel. Um, I think maybe Walt, when we met, which was kind of a, a while ago, uh, when you were running where.com, was it .com? It was where. Sure, we had a nice. .com. That, was some, um, that mattered. You know, the, the, and even before that, the kind of bet that a lot of people were making was that someday we would all have these supercomputers in our pocket with a GPS chip, and it would be some sort of thing called a location-based service that would be a possibility and maybe a big thing someday. And the crazy thing is that happened. <laughs> um, we do have all that. So what, what is the most profound change that you've seen that's now possible because of that? That's a pretty big question, Dan. Um, uh, there are so many changes. I, like it, we're, it's immersed in all of us. Location is a, a fabric through which I think enables so much of what we all do. And um, to me, the excitement around being able to live your life and the efficiency through which and the fluidity through which you can effectively do everything from book a restaurant to a hotel to you know, soon maybe pay for your gas, um, which is sexy, uh, <laughs> <laughs> is, uh, 
It's remarkable. But Dan, you know, you said it like this was not that long ago when we were all sitting here with flip phones and razor phones, and and now look at us. You know, how many people brought their laptops today? All right, so maybe a third. Yeah, nobody even brings their laptop anymore. Fundamentally, a remarkably and huge change. Anything else? I don't know what. Uh, what are you seeing? Uh, so for us. Uh, and I'm sure this applies to a lot of the businesses. Um, but I always give the example, when you think about for restaurants, if you went, uh, you've probably never gone to Google and queried restaurants in the United States when you're thinking about where to eat. Um, so for us, it's, it's a hyper-local business. You're often thinking about the neighborhood that you're in. Um, so that then translates into how your product experience needs to be. Uh, it also translates into your marketing efforts, how you're thinking about it. Um, so mobile really changes that for us, which is, that was a lot harder to do on desktop. Um, for mobile, we've, we've really embraced that, and, and really that's how we think about our product. And even if you're traveling, right, um, what we're now trying to do when you think about travelers, and, and we're part of the Priceline group, um, so obviously we have travel in our blood. Um, when you're traveling, one of the interesting things too is how companies can present their products in ways that are useful to you. So if I was to say, hey, anyone that's visiting New York, here are 3,000 restaurants, choose, it's not really a useful user experience. And so how we curate our product, how we think about that, how we can provide recommendations and personalize it, um, and really that all happens in mobile. And so I think that's where it's been really exciting evolution for and us. You're kind of interesting in, in, the, in the sense that uh, OpenTable really was a desktop yeah. service and now is I don't know, what, what percent of your activity is mobile? So, so we, uh, we did start in 1998, which for a lot of companies, that seems really old. <laughs> um, we still act like a startup at times, which is great. Um, but uh, our, our product is now over 50% of our reservations are starting on mobile. How are those users different? What are they doing differently than the desktop user? You know, it's really interesting in, in dining, and I'm, I'm sure this applies to other businesses as well, which is we're a, we're a mobile business on the weekends, right? And if you just think about it, it's always good to just to put yourselves in, in a normal situation, which is when you're out with friends or your, your spouse or someone on the weekend, you're on your phone. And so that's where if you have a presence there and a really good experience, um, you, you just have this opportunity to talk to, to customers more often, more frequently. And they tend to be stickier and, and really get to know your product. So I think it's a great opportunity to stay connected to customers. Uh, Kelly, a question for you. Wh one of the things that always blows my mind are the size of transactions people are willing to make on their phones. Um, and I assume wedding planning, uh, I don't know if they're buying the whole wedding from, from one uh, touch ID print, but what, what, uh, what are your users doing with their phones? So it's really interesting. So when we first launched the company four years ago, being content, you know, it was like 40% of our traffic was mobile. Now it's like 78%. And in the app, we, when we first launched it, we were actually allowing customers saying, hey, do you want to do a free phone consultation? They're going to plan their wedding, which on average costs $31,000, and they cannot be bothered to pick up the phone. They want to text someone. So I think that's really interesting about just the consumer, what they want to do on their phone. They actually don't want to use it as a phone. They want to use it to just tap and text. Um, our product is very unique in that they're buying small wedding planning packages, and then we're providing them, um, you know, recommendations for hotels or photographers, helping them find their products. Um, but it's really interesting how much content they want to consume on the phone, and how reluctant they are to actually chat on the phone. They want to do everything without talking to anyone. <laughs> yeah. When, when you talk about <coughs> value of transactions on mobile, we have a couple engineers from WeWork here that have built our mobile apps. And there's two ways we look at it. One is um, dollars per, right? So the average person in WeWork is spending six or $700 a month to be there. If you want to book a conference room for $50 an hour, like that's that adds up really quickly to being hundreds of dollars, which we never would have spent. I mean, you wouldn't do that on the phone. You know, Maybe you would on a late night, those uh, infomercials, you might spend money <laughs> that way, but uh, otherwise you didn't. But the other side of value is just the impact in your life. Like, what 10 years ago used to be a 10-year lease for an office space, you can now take out your iPhone or your Android device and tap a button and have an office for your company or a conference room. Like that idea, that mental shift that you will build your entire business, uh, you know, and your whole professional career around a touch of a button and hopefully touch ID eventually, 
uh, now that it's on the mobile web too, um, is just something that I think rattles people's sort of brains around like how do they, how do they kind of build differently? And I think that when I talk to people at WeWork um, that we had hired over the years, the thing I always point out is I go, remember that your product is something that people spend on every tap hundreds of dollars per interaction. Like you look at Facebook and people have 45 minutes a day on it or something like that and it adds up to be dollars per year, right? Like these people are like, when they open their phone, they're like, conference room, that's $150. Shit, if that doesn't work right, like you're screwed. I mean, your business collapses, so. Um, Steven, I think Foursquare is really interesting right now because it was kind of maybe the first location app on my phone and now every location, every app is a location app. So what does that mean today? What is, how do you, how do you have to define what you're doing and, and What's well, the strategy you take today? Yeah, I mean, so I, I think location is the atomic unit of mobile, right? I think location really is the thing. Proximity and context matter. Matters for personalization. So if you're using Foursquare, the consumer app, to uh, the city guide to find and discover places and then book a, you know, an open table or book an Uber or whatever you're going to do, um, that's one type of experience. Location also provides a tremendous amount of data. So when you say everyone, you know, is using location, we actually power about 100,000 companies that use our technology to make their experiences better for consumers. So if you're tagging a tweet on Twitter, it's calling Foursquare's API. If you're tagging a pin on Pinterest, it's calling Foursquare's API. Every Samsung phone is getting shipped with the photo app. Uh, now, you know, again, you tag content. So we're powering a lot of that ecosystem. We love that it's growing. Uh, we power a lot of that. That, in turn, gives us a tremendous amount of data. So our own consumer base, where we've had 10 billion check-ins, um, and read all the sensors of a particular place. Uh, the partners that we work with, we get a lot, of, a lot of data from. We build these products now for marketers and businesses. So if you asked me four years ago, would we be selling to hedge funds on Wall Street? I would have probably said, mm, I don't think so. And now they're, you know, they're buying our data to understand foot traffic trends of particular merchants. Um, we're working with the biggest marketers in the world who are making business decisions based on real world foot traffic data. And so the evolution and what you can do with that data is incredibly powerful. Um, and again, it all comes back to you know location being that true atomic unit. Um, and I know you were not there at the, the founding of the company, but was that you know was that a surprise when you got there that this would end up being the business for you, or is that kind of the was that you know well if you want to take credit not a surprise, was that I, your I took plan? it there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I you know it's when I came on board there was no real business model there was no revenue we had no products. Um, the thing that was so unique is we we had such an engaged consumer base to start with and all this, you know, essentially people calling the world for us. And so I looked at it and I said, wow, the, the really powerful thing here is high engagement, incredible amounts of data. We trained, you know, basically got uh, created this relationship with consumers that give them a great, a great experience. They trust you, you get data in aggregate, and then, you know, you can build products around that. And what, what does that really look like? It, it essentially, you know, watching people walk around all day and, and using that data for something? So, you know, again, we take the technology we've built and the understanding of, you know, we have about 105 million um, sh mobile shapes of what a, a place looks like to the phone, right? Not, you know, the, th this building looks very different than a satellite image would look because, again, it's, you know, GPS bounces, there's Wi-Fi signals here, there may be Bluetooth or beacon signals, we capture all that, um, and then, it allows us to do, uh, you know, to take that technology and see all the phones really in the U.S. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's being passed on a phone to lots of different partners. We make sense of that data. And uh, in an aggregate way, again, not from an individual PII way, but in an aggregate way, we can say, you know, we were talking before, people who we know are business travelers, you know, who go to airports and hotels frequently, we understand that because your phone has been there. So it's really about... Not the person, but you know, in aggregate, what are the behaviors we see and the trends we see? Right. So the old trope was you'd walk past a Starbucks and oh, you'd get a coupon beamed to your phone or something like that. You can do that, you but really, that, what's yeah. more likely now is that I'll walk past the Uniqlo or something, and then later I'm on Facebook and I'm retargeted with the Uniqlo ad because some so at some point a Foursquare server. Saw that I was there. Well, if you stop, you know, if you went in, not just walk by. It's like, was there intent where you stop? Okay. That's but also, I think if you're using Foursquare, you can, 
you know, we predict and say, you know, Dan, you're typically not, you know, maybe you're in San Francisco. We don't see your phone in San Francisco that often. We know in New York you like these places or your friends like them here, recommendations. So that predictability, I mean, you got to get it right. I think a lot of people right, didn't get right. it right. We got it right. Um, one of the kind of more interesting things uh, as mobile has matured and as kind of the mobile revolution has already happened is the introduction of new user interfaces. Um, and one I think that's really taken off globally is uh, messaging and chat-based interfaces. And uh, a few of you have chat-based bots and services. I'd love to hear kind of your initial uh, takeaways from, from those and if they've been useful or not. I can speak to that. So when we launched our virtual planner, um, obviously chat is how you engage and buy packages and, and chat for free. Um, what we realized, which is really interesting, is a vast majority of our users are downloading the app between 9 o'clock at night and 2 in the morning when they're stressed out about planning their wedding and they can't sleep. Um, and as a new product that we're testing and learning, we're not, we weren't staffing during those hours. So they got an out-of-office message. Um, we saw a direct correlation in conversion rate for people who purchase packages based on their response time. So in the last four months, someone downloads the app, 4% of people would buy a package, but 17% of people that said one word would purchase a package. So very, very high uh, conversion rates. Granted, we have a very high intent user. But what we looked at is what is the difference between those 17% that are purchasing and the other 83%? And it was, did they get a response in a minute to five minutes? And if it was happening at one in the morning when they were stressed out and they don't get a message until 8 a.m. the next day, it wasn't a great experience for them. They closed the app, they're like, this sucks. Um, and so we are introducing um, you know, our first kind of uh, iteration of a chat bot called Ava, Expert Virtual Assistant. And she's used primarily, she will be used primarily to essentially onboard people. Hey, are you currently planning a wedding? Yes, awesome, congrats, just make them feel good. Have you set your wedding date? And using it as a data collection, giving them some type of feedback loop to let them know, you know, we're here, we're answering your questions, we're telling you a little bit about how our product works. Um, and then ultimately, um, you know, someone will get back to you tomorrow to actually get this process started. So it's, you know, it's a hypothesis at this point that the chat bot will increase the conversion, but we did know that when we had, you know, at least one automatic response, conversion rates did go up. So yeah, it's really interesting. Interesting to see. I don't know if the yeah. chat bot will plan the whole wedding, but at least it'll do some of the onboarding. That's cool. Uh, Foursquare also has a uh, chat bot. That seems like it's more of a, a, just a fun new interface on the same Explore engine, basically. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, you know, we, again, we, we test kind of our core values about, you know, always innovating, never be, you know, never be satisfied and always testing new things. And uh, MarsBot is the chatbot that we created that uses our location data to simply make recommendations uh, about where to go and what to eat. And um, so, yeah, you know, I think there's not a whole lot yet to uh, report, but it's, it's a great way to, for us to learn a lot um, without messing with the other apps that we yeah. have. So. What about closing the loop? You're not charging me for restaurants yet. You kind of are. You're going to charge me for gas one day, <laughs> maybe. What's that? Where are we with that? Can we do that yet easily and comfortably? Do restaurants want me to pay you instead of them? Uh, so there's uh, what I'd say is everything's on the table, really. What we do at Open Table is we try to figure out what is the best experience for restaurants and for diners. You can imagine a lot of our partners on the restaurant side are culinary backgrounds and chefs. Uh, it's, for anyone that's ever worked in a restaurant, extremely fast-paced, challenging, difficult. They are not necessarily digitally connected all day like some of us are. Um, so I think anything that we can do to make the experience better for them, as well as for diners and closing that loop, is something that we're exploring. Um, so we get, a lot of, we get a lot of feedback on both sides of the equation. So say anything is, is fair game here. We've tested some pay products that um, I know some of you guys have used, which is great, and hopefully everyone's seen that, um, where we've made the, the process of paying the check easier, um, that essentially you can pay through Apple Pay or through our app uh, without the, the waiter or waitress having to bring you the check. Um, so it's that idea of convenience. You can just get up and go whenever you want. Um, so those are the types of experiences we're trying to create. So it makes the dining experience, you can really just focus on that and enjoy that, and it makes it better for the restaurants. We talked about earlier the, <coughs> the size of transactions. Like, I think it all, a lot of it comes down to trust. Like, can we technologically do it? You know, is the tech available today? Sure, you can charge for anything on mobile, Apple Pay exists, Android Pay. 
But I think the bigger thing that you know we've seen as we've looked at companies is what is the interaction, what is the value that somebody is looking to get from it? We invested in an interesting company called Omni, which kind of lets you, I mean, their pitch is like store your physical stuff in the cloud, right? So from your mobile device, you can not only, so you send like take your, we always, they talk about like uh, snowboards or whatever, they, they're based in San Francisco. And so you, you send your snowboard to Omni, you have this mobile app. Not only can you say, oh, I want to go snowboarding tomorrow morning, you know, and tap a button and get it and pay through that, and it might be a few dollars to get it, but you can also now give it to somebody else. So I can share my snowboard, like I share a Dropbox file, mm -hmm. and that other person is now paying for that. And we've seen this across, and I book Airbnbs all the time uh, when we're traveling, and like I'm willing to spend thousands of dollars sometimes on something in a mobile app. I trust that brand, I trust that interface. Mm -hmm. I think we're still trying to figure it out. Like chat's an interesting one, right? When you're not sure if you're like talking to a person or a bot, and you don't know like, you know, yes, it's a big I want question. To buy are you a human? And we're yeah. like, yes, yeah. we are. Exactly. But when it's not a human, how are they going to respond? How are they going to answer? Can yeah. you trust them, right? Like, can <laughs> and it, what's yeah. better? Yeah, I don't we don't know. know. We'll see. Yeah, uh, I think it's cool. interesting. You know, I, in the world of payments, like who really has the relationship? Is it the publisher, the brand, the retailer, the payment rail? And increasingly, I think that that trust um, and opportunity comes back to the publisher because that's where the relationship begins, and that allows for an awful lot more things and tremendous capability when you think about, actually, uh, we're here at Button, you know, Mike Ciccone being a big fan of federated loyalty, as it were, and what you can do as a publisher versus an individual retailer, um, allowing you to work across all retail. Now, that's a scary thing if you're a platform play, like an Apple or a Google, but if you're a publisher, it's really an opportunity. So um, I think we'll see some interesting stuff. Uh, one of the things that is kind of a, a major strategic force in my industry is the notion that we're not just building websites anymore, we're, we're building brands. So in the case of OpenTable, you know, I see that you have obviously your own app and your own website, but that you're increasingly distributing your services and your technology through different parts of the mobile user experience, whether it's embedding directly into an app like Foursquare or into Apple Maps or something like that. Is that working? Does anyone actually use those, or are they just good marketing for you? Uh, the good news is, yeah, they are. It's a good, it's a fair question. Um, I think we would all love to think everyone always starts on our brand. Right. Um, that being said, they don't. So having those strategic partnerships where it makes sense, right. um, in those examples, like the Foursquare example, it really creates a nice user experience, a really seamless user experience. So I think as long as you're thinking about that piece first and, and acknowledging they don't always come to us, um, the benefit could be that you've created this great user experience between Foursquare and OpenTable in that example, with thanks to Button, and then the user actually has a great experience, and so maybe next time they come back to you or maybe they go through that same user flow again. So I think it's, yes, there's a strategic element to that. Um, there's a expand our footprint type element to that. Um, but it's also just this acknowledgement of, of people start their dining occasions in all different places, um, and it may not be us. And so having those right partners and good user experiences can be really valuable. Hmm. Yeah. Um, flip side, while you have people's captive attention while they're waiting for their gas tank to fill up, you know where they are, they probably already put the prices into your service. Are you showing them local news, or can you give them? I, I always wonder why Uber doesn't have a Mechanical Turk uh, career option in the app, where I could <laughs> earn a couple cents per you know per waiting. task while I'm in the car. <laughs> well, well, you know, what do you do with that captive long, body? You don't yeah. want to give that to the driver, though. No, <laughs> well, we really thought long and hard about maybe installing screens on gas tanks. I'm just kidding. Um, no, <laughs> we're uh, we're getting there. Certainly, you have a captive attention, which is you know on average around five minutes, which is a lot. Um, and every retailer wants to get that consumer into the store. Um, I've been joking around with everybody. I'm trying to make gas sexy, and it's not easy. Um, but there are a few things that you should know that, you know, $575 billion a year spent at the C store in North America. That's a big deal. That tra trails Can grocery we explain only what by C store is? Because I don't know. If <laughs> <laughs> yes, Dan, I've become an expert on the C store category. That's the convenience store. Oh, okay. Um, and in fact, billions no, of it. dollars have been spent turning yep. these into actually great destinations, which we all go to. Um, and <clears throat> after um, the price of fuel, Dan, people really want to understand where they can actually get clean bathrooms. And increasingly, I'm not saying they're Whole Foods, but fresh fruit other amenities that are pretty nice. And so we're trying to help fuel that journey and make it a better 
better opportunity. But back to the um, the captive attention, certainly, you know, the mobile phone and the presence that you have during that idle time or dwell time or whenever we have the attention of somebody, how do you make it engaging and personable, you know, and like that's relevant. And so we're working on that for sure. I imagine everybody else is as well. I think one thing about the interface is what you're talking about. Like we have this phone in our pocket most of the time. Some of us have it on all the time. But uh, we also know how you, you're wearing Apple Watch, you know, and you're tracking the time on there and you're, you're interacting with other people. And I think that what's been Watching a baseball game. Well, exactly, <laughs> right? Checking the scores. Um, you know, and what's interesting about that, though, is that this mobile concept has kind of morphed very quickly into something where you don't need to always be actively engaging with it to actually gain value. So I think Marsbot was a good experiment around, you know, I land in San Francisco and I get a, hey, you got some time to kill, like you love tacos, you know, now you're in a place where there's better tacos. So, you know, here's a place nearby um, that you can check out and that comes through as a text message. And if I'm wearing my Apple Watch or, you know, my Android Wear or whatever else, you know, I see that and I don't even take the phone out. I don't tap the screen. And the fact that I walk into that store after seeing that push notification is actually the interface. Like Foursquare then says, okay, I told you you should do that, you did it. Now I know that you actually went there, I know you like tacos even more, which is pretty much what Foursquare tells me all the time. But <laughs> you know a lot about you. <laughs> you know, tacos better. and bars. <laughs> this there is you go. Awesome. <laughs> All go. right. Well, we are uh, running late, so we'll <laughs> wrap up in a second. Any, I don't know, any closing thoughts from anyone or else we can well, take an audience like question or something? <laughs> we'll throw out some question there. Anyone have any questions? Are we allowed to ask questions? All right. Well, I, I would just say it's, it's really interesting because, again, you know, I think there's one of the themes is there's a collaboration theme here, right? Like I think it requires lots of you know, companies working together. Creating the best, there's the consumer experience angle of creating the best experience, but the other thing mobile does is there's a lot of data. And I think one thing that companies here on the stage have in common are we're really good at understanding how to take data and create better experiences or take data and create um, you know, products, or, uh, products around it, business around it. And, and I'm not sure everyone's that, you know, I think a lot of people are still trying to figure that out. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's still early days, but uh, it's a lot of, a lot of synergy here in terms of doing that. All right, let's go do a deal. <laughs> right? is, that what, is that how people say it? I don't know. Uh, all right, thank you very much, and thank, thank you. you. Thanks, guys.